right, good morning, everybody. So um, I had the bright idea about a year ago that I'd go back to school at the age of 60. I'm 61 now. So I went to my third semester of class last week, all of last week. I went back to school to be a student. It's been a long time since I've had to read that much and be a student again. Uh, it's interesting, though, I, I shouldn't be surprised because I've been a student of Jesus for more than 40 years. As, as a matter of fact, do you know that the word for disciple in the Hebrew language is the word talmidim? Say that with me, talmidim. That's a disciple. It's a follower. It's, a, it's an apprentice. And so for the last three weeks, this being the fourth week, we've been in this series talking about what does it mean for us to be talmidims, students, disciples, apprentices of Jesus, our rabbi. Because remember that in the first century, a rabbi was a traveling sage who would gather around him a group of apprentices, Talmudim, and the rabbi would teach them his yoke, his yoke, like the yoke of an, on an oxen, the wooden a thing that went over their neck. The yoke was the teaching of the rabbi. The rabbi's unique perspective of the first five books of the Old Testament that's called the Torah, the Torah. And every rabbi had their own unique yoke or understanding of what it meant to flourish, to obey God's word, to flourish in our relationship with God, our relationship with ourselves, and our relationship with others. And so um, we've been considering what does it mean for us to be students of Jesus, to follow Jesus. And, 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 and those uh, that, that, that question about what it means for us to follow Jesus is a really important question for us, not just then, but now. I would argue that the single most important question you could ever answer is this. Who is my rabbi? Who, who's my teacher? Whose teaching have I yoked my life to? Uh, of the many rabbis who are out there, who is it that determines how you're living? What yoke, what teaching is it that determines how you spend your money, who you have sex with, what you do with your time and with your energy? Who is my rabbi? Who is your rabbi? Because you see, when Jesus said, come and follow me, he was saying, not just, here's geographic following. He was saying, I want you to imitate me. I want you to uh, model your entire life around me. Live by my example and live by my teaching. Um, a few weeks ago, we looked at another translation of the verse we're going to look at right now. From the mouth of Jesus, from the lips of Jesus to us. This is uh, Eugene Peterson's translation in the message of Matthew 11. Verse 28 through 30. Now remember, these are the words of Jesus. He says, are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? Sounds like today's newspaper, right? Come to me, get away with me, and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I love that phrase. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me, and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. I mean, this is an invitation from Jesus to tired, worn out, worn thin Talmudims, disciples. Uh, these disciples, he said, uh, he says, if you're, if you're sick and tired of religious rules, if you yearn for more, if you need more rest, then learn my unforced rhythms, Eugene Peterson translates. You see, Jesus is inviting us to come alongside of him, to travel with him. And yes, that means we're going to learn to shoulder the real, genuine pressures of life. You see, following Jesus is not just some transactional relationship. I put my faith in Jesus, he gives me eternal life. It's significantly more than that. Following Jesus is not one of those what have you done for me lately kind of relationships. It's a relationship into intimacy. It's, it's not a ticket out of the strains and stresses of life. That's magic. We're talking about the life of faith, of following after Jesus. It means learning from Jesus how it is that we navigate the very real 
stresses and strains that Pastor Wes's prayer beautifully uh, illustrated that we go through in everyday life. I've been reading a book that's been wrecking me called The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry by John Mark Comer. This line was worth the price of the book. If you want to experience the life of Jesus, you have to adopt the lifestyle of Jesus. Say that with me. If you want to experience the life of Jesus, you have to adopt the lifestyle of Jesus. So think of it in this way. Have you ever seen something in someone that you admired and you thought to yourself, I want to do that? I know we all have. Take, for example, the idea of fitness. You see somebody, they're real fit, they get up at five in the morning, they stretch, they run, and you think, I'm going to do that. So you go down to the sports store, you buy really nice Nike outfits, Nike shoes, matching water bottle, because you got to look good when you run, right? And you get up at five in the morning for three days, right? Am I alone? Come on, church. See, here's the deal. Here's the deal. I like the idea of health. I like the life of health. I just don't like the lifestyle of health. I like cheeseburgers too much, right? So so here's the deal. Here's the deal. What gets in the way of us following the lifestyle of Jesus is often life itself. It's to-do lists. It's more more month than money. it's, It's important things like cable news and Facebook and Netflix and Candy Crush. Those things get in the way. We like the life of Jesus. But we're not so keen on the lifestyle of Jesus. And Talmudim learned the lifestyle of Jesus. So for the last three weeks, and this is the final week we've been in this series, Healthy Start. And we've been considering um, what are, what are those well-worn paths that Jesus walked down? What are those invitations to imitation that Jesus gives to us that can help us have the lifestyle of Jesus? There are many. We've looked at four. The first we looked at was prayer. And that Jesus models for us a lifestyle of prayer. The second was worship. That Jesus also modeled a lifestyle. Not, not just one hour a week in the synagogue, but a lifestyle of worship. That Jesus modeled a lifestyle of spiritual friends. Uh, Pastor Wes helped us with that last week. And this week we're going to look at one that I believe kind of sums all three of these up. It's the, it's the lifestyle of remembering. Of remembering. Now, if you become a student of the Old and New Testament, you'll see that over and over again, uh, God lifts up the value of remembering. Now, it begs to be asked why. Why does God always tell us to remember? It's because we forget. It's that simple. We tend to forget what God has done for us in the past, good and the the, the ways he's helped us through the bad things in, in life. We, we suffer from what, what I want to call a kind of spiritual uh, amnesia that makes us, makes us forget. And so let me read to you an Old Testament text that helps us with this whole deal about this lifestyle of remembering. From Deuteronomy 6, 10 through 14. When the Lord your God brings you into the land he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, to give to you, a land with large, flourishing cities you did not build, houses filled with all kinds of good things you did not provide, wells you did not dig, and vineyards and olive groves you did not plant. Then when you eat and are satisfied, read this last line with me, ready, go. Be careful that you do not forget the Lord who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. See, here's what God says to those followers of God many, many millennia ago. He says, I'm the God who took you out of slavery in Egypt, through the wilderness, and into the promised land. And when you get to the promised land, don't forget everything that I had done for you in the past. Because we have this propensity to forget. So much so that if you keep reading in the Torah, God says to them, I want you to set apart a a time, a festival every year called the Festival of of the Passover. And in the Passover, you're going to celebrate how I brought you out of Egypt through the wilderness into the promised land. 
In every home, you will celebrate a thing called the Seder meal. And the Seder meal will be your family's remembering all that I have done for you in the past. So Jesus was a good Jewish boy. And Jesus practiced the Seder meal. And there was a time when Jesus gathered with his disciples. And he changed the liturgy of the Seder meal just a little bit. And he took bread and he took wine and he said, when you do this, he said, do this in remembrance of me. And remember that what I'm getting ready to do on the cross is what delivered you from sin and death and hell and the grave. So the Old and the New Testament affirm this reality that we tend to forget, so we need to remember. So how did Jesus remember? How did Jesus practice this lifestyle uh, of remembering? Well, remember that in this book, there are four biographies of the life of Jesus, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And we're going to look at John's biography of the life of Jesus real quickly. But we're going to look at a few verses out of John chapter 10, 10 chapters in. Now, up until this point, Jesus, and in this biography of Jesus, has performed six of seven miracles. It began, the first miracle was a changing of water into wine. And then the next chapter, chapter 10 of John 11, we're not going to look at that, Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead, which is a foreshadowing of Jesus' own resurrection from the dead at the end of the book. So all along from John chapter 1 all the way to John chapter 10, with increasing measure, Jesus has the religious leaders getting angrier and angrier and angrier with Jesus. And why were they angry with Jesus? They were angry with Jesus because of Jesus' identity. Jesus kept saying over and over again, I am God. All Jesus wanted to say was, I am God, and God loves this world. He loves everybody. But the religious leaders, fearful of losing their places of power and prominence and prestige, just kept getting angrier and angrier, so much so that they wanted to kill Jesus. So John chapter 10, uh, two little verses, verse 39 and, and, and verse 40. I just want you to read this with me. Ready? Go. And again they tried to seize him, but he escaped their grasp. Then Jesus went back across the Jordan to the place where Jesus had been baptizing in the early days. And there he stayed. So, so get this. They're so angry at Jesus that they try to snatch him up so they can silence him. But the Bible simply says, John simply says, he escaped their grasp. Now, this is where my crazy sanctified imagination sometimes kicks in. I got to wonder, did Jesus do like some really cool ninja move, you know, where he just kind of escaped? Their, 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 we're not told. But see, here's what we are told. We are told that Jesus went to this place, after eluding them, where John had been baptizing in the early years. So now, now remember, get, get the scene. These religious leaders are trying to kill Jesus. Jesus escapes them, and he goes to this place across the Jordan where John had been baptizing. And the question the teaching team asked a bunch of weeks ago is, why did Jesus choose this place? At the height of his struggles about who he is, why did Jesus choose this place on the other side of the Jordan? Well, if you become a student of scriptures, a couple of things happen to Jesus on the other side of the Jordan. See, remember Jesus' life. Remember that we know very little bit about uh, his life from, the eight, from his birth until he was about 30. As a matter of fact, what we do know of Jesus is that he lived in a little nowhere town uh, called Nazareth. We do know that his father died sometime in those 30 years, and as the eldest son, he was responsible for taking care of his mother Mary and his other siblings. And so I want you to think about that for just a moment, that God in the flesh is living here on this planet, and for 30 years, our rabbi lives in utter obscurity. If God, by the way, just is for free, 
If God has you in a place of utter obscurity, you're in the place that Jesus lived for a long time. And then about the age of 30, when most Hebrew men were considered wise, Jesus began uh, his public ministry. So flash ahead, three years later, Jesus is in a tough spot, and he comes back to the same place and the same space where he began his public ministry. And two things happened there. The first thing that happened was Jesus was baptized in that place by his crazy cousin, John. Remember John, the locust-eating, camel-hair-wearing cousin? And he had been baptizing, and he baptized Jesus. Matthew tells us this version of the baptism of Jesus. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. And at that moment, heaven was opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. Now read this last line with me. Ready? Go. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. You see, remember that until this moment, at the age of 30, Jesus is coming out of hiding. He's coming out of this obscurity in Nazareth. He's never preached a sermon, never taught a lesson, never healed a person, never cast out a demon. Jesus hasn't done a thing to earn his Father's blessing. And yet, at his baptism, Jesus hears the longing of every human heart and the longing of every human heart, friends, on this planet today, you and me and everybody online and the seven billion people on this planet, the longing of every human heart is to hear the words Jesus heard that day. This is my child, the one whom I love. It's what your heart longs to hear. It's what your heart longs to know around here at Grace Church. We call it Cogpow, child of God and person of worth. You see, when Jesus was challenged to his core at his identity, he goes back to the place and the space where his identity was set by his Father. Now, whenever I read about the baptism of Jesus, my mind immediately goes uh, to the Broadway show and the movie, The Lion King. Uh, I've got four grandkids, so I've seen the movies a bunch of times. And, uh, and I love the story because it's the story of Simba, this, uh, this young lion cub who, who is lost because he thinks he killed his father. And in this really cool transcendent moment that he has with his father at a riverbank, his father speaks to him from beyond and he says these words, you have forgotten who you are and so have forgotten me. Look inside yourself, Simba. You are more than what you have become. Remember who you are. You are my son and the one true king. Remember who you are. You see, Disney World didn't think that up. The God of the universe wove it into the fabric of the universe and every human being longs to know that they matter to God, longs to know that they are the beloved sons and the beloved daughters of God. That's why when we sing these songs that we sang earlier, your eyes fill with tears because you know that's who you really are. Martin Luther, the great reformer, struggled with depression, and so if you struggle with depression, you're in good company. Martin Luther, the great reformer, as he would struggle with deep moments and bouts of darkness, he would walk into the church and make his way to the front, to the uh, baptismal font. He would dip his hand in the water, and he would make the sign of the cross, and he would repeat over and over again, I am baptized, I am baptized, I am baptized. That's who you are. You are a child of God and a person of worth, and we want you to know that. And so um, we're trying to help you with that because here's what we know. We know there's a lot of pressures that tell you you're not. So we've got a little gift for you uh, to our friends who are here in the room. Um, our creative teams put together this I'm a child of God and personal worth name tag. Cog pal tag. Some of us need to just make it into a necklace. <laughs> Wear it around. 
But can I suggest to you, you might take this name tag and put it in the spot that challenges you the most in terms of your identity. For a lot of us, it's our television set. Because we're hearing crap come out of the TV set that tells you you don't matter to God. And it's all a lie straight from the pit of hell. Some of us need, because we struggle with stuff on the computer, too many games or porn. I don't care which it is. We need to put this on the computer screen. Remind ourselves that we're a child of God and a person of worth. Some of us spend a lot of time in our car. We need to put it on the rear view mirror. Some of us need to put it on the mirror in the, ba- in the bathroom. Wherever it is that you need to do that, you do that. For our friends online, you can download our wallpaper. Put it on your computer screen and on your phone. Friends, Jesus, God in the flesh, went to the place and the space where he was baptized to remember that he was a child of God and a person of worth. The second thing that happened in that space that Jesus revisits is that Jesus experiences 40 days in the wilderness and temptation. Now remember that in the original Greek language, there are no chapter and verses. And so after we read about Jesus hearing that he is the beloved of God in his baptism, the very next line that Matthew writes is this. We call it Matthew chapter 4, verse 1. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the where? Into the wilderness to be what? Tempted by the devil. Yeah. This challenge happens immediately after his baptism. And isn't that just like the evil one? Because I know in my own life, the temptations from the devil come right after my most intimate moments with God and my most powerful moments of ministry. He knows when to get me. And he does that to Jesus. And notice, though, that Matthew tells us that Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. You see, there's lots of hope here. Because before the wilderness was a place of temptation, before the wilderness was a place of temptation, it was a place of intimacy. Uh, This week I did a study in the four biographies of Jesus about the wilderness, and almost every time that Jesus goes to the wilderness, it's to pray and to be intimate with his Father. Jesus was led by the Spirit into this place of intimacy, but into this place of intimacy, the evil one broke through and tried to tempt the Savior of the world. You see, we're going to experience temptation in our life, but temptation becomes an opportunity for us to show God off. Look at what Beekner says. To be commanded to love God at all, let alone in the wilderness, is like being commanded to be well when we are sick, to sing for joy when we are dying for thirst, to run when our legs are broken. But check this out. But this is the first and great commandment nonetheless. Even in the wilderness, especially in the wilderness, you shall love him. And that's what Jesus models for us. He models fidelity to God even in the wilderness of temptation. Jesus withstood what Paul later would call in Ephesians 6, the fiery darts of the evil one. And so can you. Go with me back to the Lion King, to my granddaughter Mia's favorite line. It's a word from Rafiki, the priest, to Simba, the one who struggled with his identity, Oh, yes, the past can hurt, but from the way I see it, you can either run from it or learn from it. Or Beekner says it a little bit better. To remember the past is to see that we are here today by grace and that we have survived as a gift. You see, the wilderness can be a place of intimacy, but the wilderness with temptation can also be our teacher as we practice the lifestyle of Jesus And we remember. Often I'll hear Christ followers say, I don't want to remember that stuff. I don't want to remember what it was like before I know Jesus. My life was a chain wreck. It was so much pain. And I used to think that until I heard Stephen Curtis Chapman's song back in the mid-90s. Remember your chains. The chorus went like this. Remember your chains. Remember the prison that once held you before the love of God broke through. Remember the place you were without grace. When you 
see where you are now, remember your chains, and remember your chains are gone. You see, there's a gift of remembering, even remembering these difficult moments, because it is in those moments that God's grace flooded into your life. Or as Barbara Williams Riddle, one of my mentors, taught me, in Christ, you remember in a new way. You remember the struggles, you remember the temptations, but you remember them in a new way. So Jesus is at the height of his conflict with these religious leaders. It's at a feverish pitch, and they're denying his identity. They're denying his calling. And Jesus went to the place and the space. He modeled for us what it means to experience both the powerful affirmation of his identity in his baptism and the very challenge to that identity in the wilderness. Jesus practiced the lifestyle of remembering. And remember what John Mark Comer says, if you want the life of Jesus, you have to practice the lifestyle of Jesus. So let me sum it all up. Uh, If we will practice this lifestyle of remembering, here's what it does in us. Remembering God's faithfulness in the past renews my hope for the future. Say that with me. Remembering God's faithfulness in the past renews my hope for the future. It means that we can go back so that we can go go forward. Pastor Wes has been helping a whole bunch of us with a new concept he's come up with uh, called uh, your highlight reel. So if you've ever been um, to a major league baseball game or watched one, when the home team batter gets up to bat, There'll be about 30 to 45 seconds where the music gets real loud. The screen starts popping all these images, one after the other, of the guy who's getting ready to go up to bat doing something great, hitting a home run, making a great catch, doing a a, a, a throw that nobody could make. The crowd goes crazy. It pumps up the batter. The one thing you notice they don't do is they don't show the guy who's getting ready to bat striking out. They don't throw him missing a a, a catch or, or making a bad throw. They go to the highlight reel. And can I suggest to you that you and Jesus both have a highlight reel? He has a highlight reel in your life. And when troubles arise, when challenges to your identity arise, when temptation comes your way, you turn to your highlight reel and you hear the tender words of your father at your baptism. You are my beloved. You feel his sustaining presence in your temptation. And let me get personal. Like everybody in this room, and I think everybody on the planet, the last 18 months have been pretty bad. Can I get an amen on that? It's been pretty bad. Here's my inner world secret. There have been a lot of days in the last 18 months that at least in my mind, I've written out my letter of resignation to send to the bishop and the board and say, I'm done, 25 years is enough. I've never led a church through a pandemic. I've never led a church through these days of vitriol where people in the church that I love are often hurting one another with their words. And there have been days that's been too much for me to bear. And I've wanted to quit. I wanted to say I can't do it anymore. But then there's this highlight reel. And the Holy Spirit takes me back to my highlight reel. And there's one place and one space. And in the last 18 months, I have visited again and again and again. It's a musty old basement at Trinity Hill United Methodist Church in Lexington, Kentucky. It was my first ministry job 38 years ago where God took a a handful of high school students and he wrecked them. And my dirty little secret then was that I was ready to quit seminary. And God has reminded me over and over again, look what you would have missed if you'd quit. And then I flash ahead 38 years when I want to quit, 
And the Lord says, look what you would have missed. Do you know who one of those kids in that youth group was? It was Pastor Wes. Our pastor. Look what you would have missed. And so remember, it's a lifestyle. There was this time in the life of Jesus when he took his Talmudim, his students, to another musty room that we call the upper room. And he met with them there. And he said, I want you to have a table of remembrance to remember what I have done for you. And you remember what Jesus did, right? He gathered with those highly imperfect disciples. And Jesus took bread and he blessed it. And then he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is broken for my imperfect students. (laughs) And then Jesus, he took the cup This was the Seder meal, friends, and Jesus is changing it, and he takes the cup, and he says, this is the blood of the new covenant. (laughs) And then Jesus said to his disciples, then and now, he says, and every time you do this, you do this what? In remembrance of me. And so tonight, or today, we come to remember him, to experience him, to remember what he did on the cross for you and for me. That when we were lost in our sin, in our brokenness, in our addictions and in our afflictions, that Jesus came to rescue us. And so for my friends online, I hope you have your elements of little bread and little juice. For my friends here, I invite you to take the little elements that you were given. Just take off the first little layer. And friends, remember that this is the body of Christ It's been given for you so that when you forget who you are, you remember whose you are. You belong to God. Take and eat and be thankful. Then if you'll peel back the second layer. This is the blood of Jesus. When you're in the wilderness of temptation, this is the blood of Christ that sets us free. Take and drink and be thankful. Let's pray. And so, Lord, we thank you that we can remember in this place and in this space. We can remember who we are in you. We can remember what you have done for us. You've been so faithful in the past. And may it stir within us hope for our future. Give to all of us the gift of trust in you today because you have been so good to us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Everybody agreeing said, amen, amen. So we're going to sing a closing song about the goodness of God. Um, The altar will be open if you want to come and pray. You can do that. If you want somebody to pray with you, lift a hand. Let's stand together. Let's sing the goodness of God.